How are you guys? Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, so my name is Adam Braun, and I'm the founder and CEO of this organization, Pencils of Promise. And in the last four years, we've gone from a place uh, that you'll hear about, starting with very, very humble beginnings, to now um, what I really believe is, is becoming a leading global education organization. But what I want to do today is talk to you all um, about the path, uh, what it takes to go from an idea and how that idea is birthed to um, now really working on solving a, a truly global challenge. Um, and so I'll take you through my story, the story of the organization. But along the way, I want to share with you guys these five phrases that have guided me uh, along this, this path. And so um, this is where my journey starts with my family. Uh, this is my cousins, my grandmother. Uh, and I'm the really cool kid in the yellow sweater over here. <laughs> Um, and, you know, from a very early age, we were a very closely knit family, but more than anything, we lived in a home where education was the top priority. My grandmother and grandfather were Holocaust survivors, and uh, it was always, you know, a part of our upbringing that we knew that the only way that they had removed themselves from this horrific situation, emigrated into the country, and then uh, my parents were able to lift themselves up was through the, the, the dedication to education. Um, and like most of you here at, at Columbia, um, I was an academic growing up. I played a lot of sports too, basketball in particular. And I went to Brown University and I found myself a student athlete, which uh, I'm sure some of you in the room are as well. Um, and this was myself uh, at the age of 22, uh, you know, entering graduation, which I think is something that uh, hopefully some of you guys are going to be facing soon. But um, what I want to take you through today are these, these five phrases that have guided me. Uh, at, at various points in my life, at 21, 23, 25, 27, and now as of four days ago, 29. Um, and so, uh, you know, my upbringing was one where uh, there was a clear path ahead. I wanted to work in finance my entire childhood. I wanted to work on Wall Street. Uh, I was competitive, and, you know, I played sports and mathematics for uh, the subject that I was most interested in. And so wanting to work on Wall Street, it's, it's a very neatly defined path to grow from you know, New England upbringing, New England school, to then move to New York. And I saw a film when I was 21 that's called uh, Baraka. Uh, and it was shot in 24 countries around the world. And hopefully uh, I can start with, with the first phrase that really resonated uh, with me, which was to get out of your comfort zone. I, I, I saw um, this, this, uh, this talk, and this person shared these wonderful stories of traveling all around the world. And at the age of 21, I got this phrase in my head, get out of your comfort zone. For, for one time in my life, I wanted to be uncomfortable. I, I hope that resonates with some of you. It's, it's a strange feeling, but when I thought about the greatest art, the greatest creations that, that came out of either you know, music and, and painting and sculpture, it always seemed to be that the artist produced those, those pieces in, in eras of struggle, not in eras of complacency. And so I thought, just once in my life, I want to know who I am. And I feel like I can you know, find that when I, when I get out of my comfort zone. And I discovered this program called Semester at Sea. It's a cruise ship that goes around the world, and you stop in 10 countries. And you know, you're able to explore and backpack uh, countries across the developing world for four to six days. And I said, that's it. That's how I'm going to be uncomfortable. Um, I'm going to go, and I'm going to travel the developing world, and I'm going to do so without knowing a single person. And so I withdrew from school. I quit the basketball team. Uh, and I didn't tell a single person I knew outside of my parents. And I said, I'm going to go on Semester at Sea. And we left from Vancouver uh, in early 2005. And uh, we crossed the North Pacific for the first time in the history of the voyage in winter. They'd always gone the other way, but they had a new ship my year. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you will remember this, but uh, in January 2005, a thousand person cruise ship was struck head on by a 60 foot rogue wave 900 miles from land in the dead of winter with hypothermic water all around. And that was my ship. And so I'm going to show you guys a video that has surfaced on YouTube since. Uh, it's about a minute long. Um, so what you're going to see here is the captain looking out on what are 40-foot swells. And again, we're about 900 miles from land. So now you'll see the actual wave as it strikes our ship. So here's the wave. And then 
this is our ship. So this is our ship, Harris. And again, you guys don't have to freak out. I was on the ship, not, not anyone in this room. Um, but going through an experience like that, as you saw, the water came through the window. And what you don't know is that housed all the navigational equipment and the power to our engines. So when the water came through, we lost all power to our engines, which caused a mayday alert. And this panicked announcement that I'll never forget came over the loudspeakers. You know, uh, help the women and children up the stairs. Everyone get to the fifth floor or higher. Um, you know, get to your muster stations, is, is what he said, which is where you evacuate a ship from. And there was a feeling of certain death, absolute certain death. It, it wasn't a question at all. And when you're faced with certain deaths, I've only had it once, but um, a few things happen. One of them is uh, you, you suddenly start to no longer question, you know, the how or the what, but the why. You say, why is this happening? Why am I here? And about 30 seconds in, I, I, I felt this overwhelming calm. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was not my time to perish. I can't explain it, but I knew I had something more to do here. And, and in that moment, I found a sense of purpose, which I think is the single most powerful thing that any one of us can find, is, is a true sense of meaning, that you have a sense of belonging, that you have a mission here in this existence. And the next thing that I needed to, to face, and fortunately, obviously I'm here, we survived. Uh, through mass hysteria. You can imagine the whole room flipping sideways and everyone screaming. It was much like Titanic, but we didn't go down. Um, and so uh, fortunately we survived, and, and now I had this renewed sense of, of commitment to purpose. And the next thing that I experienced was backpacking for the very first time in the developing world. And I would ended up traveling over the next few years through more than 50 countries as a backpacker because I felt that, that I could you know, discover this purpose by immersing myself in new experiences. And for you guys as college students, there's nothing that I could advocate more than to get out of your comfort zone while you can and immerse yourself in something radically new that challenges everything that you've ever believed before. And I had this habit of asking one child per country what they wanted most in the world. I'd say, if you could have anything, what would you want most? And when I was in India, where the poverty was at its most extreme that I had ever witnessed, this young boy was begging on the streets. I said, if you could have anything, what would you want? And he looked at me and he said, a pencil. And that was it. I said, you can have anything. And he said, a pencil. And it was so profoundly powerful and it immediately illuminated to me that this was the plight of millions of children. Right now, about 61 million children who do not have access to any form of education, no schooling. And, and I suddenly realized, this is, this is my mission, is, is to eradicate this global injustice. And so um, at the age of 23, I had graduated. I had traveled a fair amount. And like I said, I wanted to work on Wall Street. And I got this new phrase in my head, challenge your assumptions so that you can find your truths. And I think inside of each of us, you know, we have kind of different ideas spinning through our head, but we have these truths that are internal. They come from the heart, they come from the soul. And when you follow those truths, you will never be led wrong. I've made a career of this now. Um, and there are these inherent truths, and they are different for each of us, but they are there, and they only come when you break down the walls of assumptions that each of us have been raised upon and, and taught by, by traditional society. Um, and so I, I ended up saying, all right, you know something? Everyone else is going off and working straight out um, in a job. And I'd always been an entrepreneur, so I'd started several businesses. And I, I took my money, and I, I went and I backpacked uh, Latin America for, for four months, just before I, I started working in New York City. And I just want to share one story from that experience that led to me finding my truth. Um, I, I was in a, a remote, remote area of Guatemala, um, and I looked up one day, and there was a man. His name was Joel Puak. This is Joel. Um, and he came up to me, and he asked me if I would come stay with him in his village. And at that point in time, that was a crazy idea. I'm kind of by myself out in the middle of nowhere in Guatemala, and this man is saying, come stay with me in my home. And I said, well, I don't really know you, and we're speaking broken Spanish. And I said, why? And he said, well, I, I, I've taught myself to read from my Bible. I can read English. I'm a teacher. But I can't pronounce it very well. So I want you to come and stay with me and read English into a tape recorder every night so that I can teach English to my children. And it was such a profoundly powerful idea that he wasn't asking for a handout. He wasn't asking for money. He was asking for me to read so that he could teach his own children. And I thought, this is an exceptional uh, opportunity. My parents will kill me if I do this. Um, but yeah, I'm going to do this. And I took shuttle buses to shuttle buses to other buses to this remote town where 
Um, there were no phones, nothing. I was the first gringo in the, in the history of the, the village. Um, and I got to Hoel's home, and this is, this is my, my supplies. Here was the Bible. He had, shockingly, a pamphlet called Raising Kids Who Don't Smoke. Um, and <laughs> I don't know how he had that. He had his dictionary, um, this large tape recorder that I read into uh, for the next three days. And because I have a bad stomach, I brought peanut butter, jelly, and a loaf of bread. And that's all I ate for the next three days. So you can see my, my butter knife. And, um, and what I, I, I found when I got there was it wasn't just Hoel. It was him and his wife. Um, and so they set me up on this lovely bed with my backpack. You can see back in the day. And uh, what I didn't know was that on the other side of the room was Hoel and his wife in the same room. It was only a one-room home. But I lived with him for three days. I read English uh, into his tape recorder. And um, witnessing Hoel's commitment to his children's education informed this broader philosophy on how an organization could be built that was about empowering locals, that wasn't about handing out gifts from the top, but was a ground-up approach to um, finding leadership within communities that was truly dedicated to their children's education, and then empowering them to, to, to spread that to their communities and beyond. Um, and so I ended up moving into New York City, and I started working at what, what I thought was the top corporate training that I could find to one day start an organization that would truly affect global education. And that was by working at Bain & Company, a top tier consulting firm. And I worked at Bain for a few years, and I learned how Fortune 500 companies were advised to become even better. It was literally the, the, the best business training possible. But I found that I was kind of losing my, my passion for service work, for education. And you know, when you go out to a bar or, or somewhere, a social function, and somebody says, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a management consultant, and you're 24 years old. It, it's not an inspiring conversation. It wasn't for me, because I didn't feel like I was speaking the language of the person that I sought to become. I wanted to become somebody who was going to start a nonprofit or an organization that was going to affect global education. And so this was the third phrase. It was, speak the language of the person that you seek to become. And I sought to become somebody who started this. And so I started just changing the language by which I spoke. And I really believe when you start to project ideas into the universe, the universe starts to manifest around the, their eventuality. And so I started saying, my name is Adam, et cetera. Well, what do I do? I, I work in consulting, but I'm going to start an organization that's going to build one school. And we're going to start to affect global education. And so I got this big idea in my head. I said, on the side of my job, I want to try and find a way to build one school. Uh, my grandmother, who was a Holocaust survivor, was getting older. I wanted to build one school and dedicate it to her. And uh, I was turning 25, and so I went to the bank and I said, I want to, I have this big dream. But, but big dreams, they start with small and reasonable acts. And so I said, my big dream is to build one school. How do I start? And at Bank of America, they said, well, you have to start by opening up an account with $25. I said, well, whew, OK, that's a good sign. I'm turning 25 this month. So here was the bank deposit slip on October 1st, 2008, when I put $25 into a bank account and started, officially, Pencils of Promise, um, this organization having passed out pencils because of that one child in India. Um, and I ended up throwing a birthday party. I'm born on Halloween, and I just don't think that I needed more gifts. So I asked friends to give small donations at the door. And through a series of small events with 20-somethings, we were able to raise the money to build our very first school. And I, I took a sabbatical. I left my job. And I went out to Laos, one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia. Um, and I was riding a motorbike every day out to this, this remote village called Patong. And I turned around one day. We had just broken ground in this very first school. And uh, again, I could tell you guys a million stories about how the organization was built, but I want to focus on the lessons today. So I turn around, and I see these two beautiful young girls, three girls, actually. <laughs> Justin Young means what's your name? <laughs> and name day means smile. Tamun. Tamun. Justin Young? Neat. <laughs> so what you're going to see now is there's an existing primary school, but we were building a preschool. And I just met these girls literally in this moment. It kind of hits me. And you're going to be our first preschool students. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good? <laughs> All right, I think you guys like it. So now I'm smitten. Now I'm just totally in love, not just with the idea of building a school, but I, I have these girls whose lives could truly change. And what was incredibly uh, personally transformational was months later when I got this, this picture. And I, Facebook was just kind of getting legs at this point in time. And so I got 
posted this, and then I posted this picture, which was Nina and Newt now in their very first classroom. And this, this language that I had been speaking became real, right? It, it was no longer just an idea. It was incredibly real. Um, and so I came back to my job, and I had to make this critical decision. Do I return to Maine after I took this sabbatical, or, or do I pursue the person that I really genuinely believe I'm on, on Earth, that I'm in this existence to become? And that's when I heard this phrase, um, that you make the little decisions with your head and the big ones with your heart. And I think every single person at some point in your life, it, you know, it might be a, a, a relationship, a home, where you live, a job that you choose, a school that you end up attending, but you have these massive decisions and your head will tell you something. I'm here to tell you, follow your heart. Your heart will never lead you wrong if you follow. You, you, you might find challenges and, and regrets, but those regrets are temporary. If you follow your heart, you will not go wrong. And that's what I did. I said, I'm going to go and focus on building a best-in-class organization. And I noticed that there was profit and purpose and that those were traditionally separate, and that uh, there was an emerging generation that said, no, that that's not the case anymore, that they're intersecting, and that we each have a sense of profitable purpose, where, where it's not just about maybe making the world better or, or advancing yourself, but that those two can intersect in a way in which you are advanced and society is made better as well. And I said, this, this phrase, nonprofit, it makes no sense to me. It's the only industry that says what it's not. Right? Why does it say you're non-profit? And none of us are driven by not profiting. We're driven by making you know, true value, purpose uh, emerge. And so I said, Pencils of Promise, yeah, we're technically a non-profit, but we're not going to treat ourselves that way. We're, in, we're a for-purpose organization. We're, we're about making the world better. We're not about lack of profits. Um, and we're going to be driven by data. The same way that Bain trained me and so many others on building a best-in-class company, we were going to take the same approach to best-in-class problem solving on, on global issues, and that we would build a movement of people, of, of true citizen philanthropy. And there's amazing stories all across the organization. These are, this was a girl who raised $250, educated uh, 10 kids by shouting at people on the corner of 42nd and 10th. This girl, uh, Kennedy Donnelly, she's 17. She just rode a bicycle across the country um, and raised $10,000 in doing so. We threw a party for her at our office. A donor was there and said, you know something? I'm going to match it. I'm going to do another 10. And her response last week was, geez, I should have just started here and I would have met my goal. <laughs> and then Lewis, who donated his birthday, said, I'm going to match um, every dollar donated. And he raised $25,000 to build a full school. Um, and so this is our, our, our story now. This is the snapshot. Pencils of Promise, as of this week, has broken ground on 90 schools around the world in, in four different countries uh, across Africa, Latin America, and Asia. There's over 400,000 supporters in, in some form of this organization. And, uh, we've delivered more than 3 million educational hours. And this is what I feel like is, is um, my purpose. But it was only found through following those four mantras that I shared earlier. Um, one great uh, kind of part of this story is that I returned um, later on and, and thanked Toel as we opened up our first school. As of this week, um, we broke ground on a new school every day last week in Guatemala. We've now built 40 schools in Hoel's region so that people like him are empowered to educate their children. Um, you know, now it's about continuing to speak that language. We'll break around on a new school every 90 hours in the coming year. Uh, that's a big claim, but I know that this organization can do it. Uh, and the way it's going to happen is by a movement of the people. And so um, this is one way to easily find me, adam at ipromise.org. It's very simple in case any of you guys want to get in touch. And the very last thing that I'll share with you is, is the current phrase that's guiding me right now. Um, it's how can you with the knowledge that the world will change in the next 10 years and you will change within it, how can you create the most positive impact for as many lives as possible? I think every one of us has the capability to truly transform millions of lives. Every person is a revolution being carried within a vessel. And it's just about finding your purpose, activating it. And I hope that each of you dream big, because um, if your dreams aren't scaring you, then I really believe that we're not dreaming big enough. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah.